Terrific. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, nothing better to do on a Friday afternoon in October um, than to spend two hours staring at a Zoom screen. Um, but this is gonna be action packed and with just uh, uh, something for everyone, um, I'm convinced. We've had a lot of researchers um, who would like to share um, a little snippet of what they're doing in the second half of the Data Summit. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm Janet McCabe. I'm the director of the IU Environmental Resilience Institute. Um, I'm happy to welcome you and, ki and kick this off. This I think maybe is our third Data Summit that our uh, data manager, Justin Peters has organized. Um, I, I just wanna say that from the very beginning, data um, has been a key part of what the Environmental Resilience Institute is all about. And a part of our founding principles and philosophy that in addition to all the great work that everybody's doing at IU, um, that we make that those data available as much as we can, both to people within the university to help foster um, interdisciplinary research and, and, and teams coming together that might, might not have thought that they were interested in what a plant ecologist was doing, but it turns out they are. Um, but also for people outside the university. And the, this grand challenge and the Environmental Re Resilience Institute are all about impact in the real world um, in Indiana. And um, I'm so pleased to say that after three years and a little bit of this grand challenge, we are really starting to see that impact happening. Uh, we're also really starting to see our researchers um, uh, deliver in terms of uh, having some results, having some data to talk about, publishing papers, um, having meaningful work to get out there. And that's really no surprise either. You, you, you don't um, uh, produce work instantly. It took a while. Um, so I think that these data summits and the data that we are able to put on our website is just going to grow and grow and grow. Um, and I'm very grateful to Justin and um, our student, Kimberly Cook, um, who works with Justin and to our um, communications manager, Jonathan Hines um, and Joe Lang, um, uh, O'Neill grad student who works with him on the website, um, that they are working hard to make sure that we're actually gonna have those data available in a very easy to access way, whether you're inside the university or outside the university. Um, to that end, um, Justin is um, starting to, um, or has been meeting with a number of ERI researchers um, to talk about what data they have and, um, and whether it's ready um, to be uh, placed on the ERI website. Um, if he hasn't come knocking on your door yet, he will. Um, so please open that door for him and um, invite him in. Um, and, uh, and, and he can, cause he can help you um, uh, get a broader impact for the work that you're doing. If you're on this data summit and you're not already somebody that's been part of a project funded by the Grand Challenge, that's okay. Um, we, any, as far as I'm concerned, data that are relevant to environmental change and climate resilience in Indiana or beyond um, are definitely things that we'd like to consider uh, making available through our website to just get, get more attention uh, to those things. So um, I think that um, that's all I wanted to say. Um, by way of, of, of starting. Um, I wanna thank you again. Um, we're, we're in year four of this grand challenge. We're very much looking forward to um, life at, um, at ERI and life in uh, the world of interdisciplinary climate resilience research at IU post the grand challenge. Um, you guys are all partners with us in making that happen. So um, I look forward to many more gatherings like this. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin and, uh, and, and turn my video off and um, mute myself and start listening. Uh, thank you for the uh, intro, Janet. Um, for everyone that uh, is joining us right now, we have about 25 participants. Uh, we are expected to have about 15 uh, data updates uh, later on in the afternoon. So we are gonna have uh, multiple people uh, joining us a little bit later. Uh, but as of right now, the, we have two presentations to start with, and uh, the first one is from Abraham Lauer and uh, Ben Kravitz, a new downscaled climate data set for Indiana, and I am going to turn it over to uh, Abraham. All right. Uh, all right, hopefully you're seeing this uh, presentation. Cool. 
let's do this. All right, so as Justin said, uh, my name is Abraham Lauer. Uh, I'm in my second year in uh, the graduate studies in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the project I've been working on for the past year, year and a half, uh, which is looking at a, a new downscale climate data set for Indiana. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, so I said it's my project. Uh, it is a group of people's projects. Uh, ben Kravitz is taking the, the lead on this uh, and we're joined by several other faculty members, both from atmospheric science and geography. And as Janet said earlier, the Grand Challenge has been going on for four years uh, and I've only been here for a year and a half. Uh, so I'm carrying the torch that's been passed on to me uh, by several other students uh, that have been working on this. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, essentially at a very high level, we are trying to dynamically downscale climate output from the community earth system model over Indiana and the surrounding areas to three kilometer resolution. So that's a lot of words and I'll get into that. But essentially like the main, main questions we're trying to answer is what's climate change actually going to look like over Indiana? Um, in particular, what, what will extreme events look like? Because those are often the most costly events that uh, occur in, in terms of climate. Um, no one's ever done dynamical downscaling over Indiana. Uh, the closest thing we've got is a statistical downscaling uh, study that was done by Notre Dame over Indiana. So we want to look at uh, what results we get and how they compare to uh, the results that Notre Dame found and see if there's any guidance that we can provide. What, what do we do better? What did their methods do better? Um, and compare and contrast those. And then finally, this is the data summit. We want to provide our data set to any downstream applications that can use it. Um, any water resources, health impacts, agriculture, ecology. I'm sure you guys can fill out that list for yourselves. So uh, dynamical downscaling is climate modeling. So what's, a, what's in a climate model? Essentially, a climate model divides the earth up into a bunch of little boxes, grid boxes, and you can see a, a representation here. Uh, the grid boxes are both horizontal, um, north, south, east, west, as well as vertical, uh, looking at either height or pressure uh, differences. And within each of these grid boxes, the model is trying to solve equations, uh, solving equations uh, based on how much radiation is coming in, uh, if there's water vapor or uh, air movement going on, how much movement, how much momentum that is generating, uh, different things like that. And so it's all, these models are all built on these physical processes. And some of them are quite simple, like how much solar radiation is coming in from the sun. That's a, that's a one line equation based on the time of year and the latitude. That's not a hard thing to do. But if we get a little more complicated, is, it, is precipitation falling? That can be more complex to try and solve that equation. Is it falling as snow or is it falling as rain? Uh, is, there, is there advection? Is, is warm air being pushed up from the tropics or is cold air coming down from the poles? Uh, those are different things that the climate model is, is solving uh, based on these equations. And at the end of the day, it's, it's figuring out what does, what does the earth look like at this point? What does the climate look like uh, for these series of time steps that the climate model is uh, putting out? So uh, dynamical downscaling generally has two different models that are used. Uh, the first one that we use is CESM, the Community Earth System Model. This is a global climate model. Um, it has about a one degree resolution and that ends up being roughly 100 kilometers. And it does the entire earth uh, from 1950 to 2100 uh, under various RCP forcing scenarios. So we're using that to essentially carry out uh, the, or to provide the climate change signal. So uh, we're not necessarily thinking about, you know, in, when we're looking at Indiana, what's happening in the Pacific Ocean, but what's happening in the Pacific Ocean is really important because El Nino plays a, a vital role in uh, weather all over the globe. So that's definitely going to affect what's happening in Indiana. And so we start with this uh, global climate model to kind of get, a, get a, uh, a high level look at what's going on uh, across the entire globe. And then from there, we take the output from that climate model. Uh, the output that we're using was actually from the fifth uh, community model in a comparison project, which was done back in 2005. Um, and so we're taking output from that model and we're plugging it into WARF. WARF is the weather research forecast model and our domain across Indiana has a resolution of three kilometers. 
So WARP is actually really good at uh, taking uh, uh, weather conditions that CESM uh, gives it and uh, resolving those, you know, really, really high, high resolution uh, equations and, and kind of balancing them on these really small scales. And, and it can predict like, oh, a squall line of thunderstorms moving across uh, the state or, or different things like that. With 100 kilometer resolution, you're never going to get that sort of uh, a detail just because uh, a line of thunderstorms is going to be, you know, maybe two or three or five kilometers thick. So uh, this is kind of a, a generic downscaling slide uh, to kind of give, give an idea of, of how this works. So we define different domains uh, within, within our methodology. And so outside this white box here, um, we might be using this, the CESM data that is 100 kilometers. Um, I think you can see down here, it's uh, 111 kilometers. And then inside that box, uh, everything gets shrunk. So all, all the grid boxes get cut in half essentially and it's 55 kilometers in there. And then as you go into further domains, you go for, uh, further and further and you get, your grid sizes get smaller and smaller. So you can see down here, 55 to 28 uh, into 14. And then finally, when we get to the region that we care about, we have the smallest domain. And that looks like it's seven kilometers in this study. And so why is this important? Well, if you think about a place like California, California has a lot of different topographical features that uh, will interact with weather and climate very differently. Um, the coast and the ocean, bre ocean breezes coming off the coast. Um, you've got this mountain region, you've got the Central Valley, you've got the Sierra Nevadas, both the, the windward side and the leeward side. And all of those things uh, will, will, if you have a too big of a resolution, those, th those, those features just kind of get washed out and it's, it ends up being a, a flat, flat chunk of land when we know it, it's not. And so that's why we need a, a small resolution to be able to resolve these features. So Indiana obviously does not have uh, such a uh, varied topography, but there is, there's definitely a difference. If you look at some place up uh, near Lake Michigan where it's mostly agricultural, I don't think anyone's gonna say that areas up here are equal or very, or, you know, very similar to areas in southern Indiana where we get into the rolling hills. And so this slide gives a, a rough idea of what this downscaling might look like where you've got these big grid cells uh, where essentially everything within each of these cells is exactly the same. So there's no topography difference from this point to this point. And uh, we can, um, we downscale and we end up with a grid that looks more like this. Um, again, this is a representation. Uh, so this this is not actually a one degree and this is not actually three kilometers, um, but you get the idea of, of how uh, adding in uh, downscaling to these, this much finer grid can give us a lot more information. Are there any questions on uh, downscaling and uh, kind of the methodology that we're using? Cool. All right. So what does this actually give us? If we went, okay, I ideas and uh, pictures are fine, but what do we actually get out of downscaling? So this is an uh, example of wharf output on the very first time step of when it's running. And so it has just taken data in from CESM, this global model, and it's interpolated it onto our grid space. And that's why you're not seeing these giant blocks um, and it's not really blocky, it's already smoothed out, but there's not a lot of information here. Yeah, you can see it's it's cold uh, up in Wisconsin and it's warm in Indiana, it's even warmer down in Tennessee. And it looks like there's maybe a front here, but how well, I mean, you, you're not getting a ton of information out of this. So uh, the way the, our methodology, they're, they're basically, I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot and say there are roughly two ways uh, to do downscaling. One is you turn on Morph and you keep it running and you just let it run for a hundred years and you update the boundary conditions outside of the, of the domain. And those, the, the changes in the boundary conditions is what kind of feeds into the model and that uh, updates the conditions. We're not doing that here. 
we're not interested in one continuous long run. Uh, we're more interested in making sure that our climate signal stays as close to what CESM is giving us uh, as possible. And so what we do is we, we turn on Wharf and we run it for 12 hours and we say, okay, the first 12 hours, we're gonna throw those away because the model needs some spin up time to equilibrate across the entire domain. And then uh, the next 12 hours, we say that's actual data that we're gonna save. And then we restart Wharf. So every 12 hours, we're basically moving, moving the starting point forward and restarting it. Uh, and then and then running it for another 12 hours. And so if you, uh, this is June 2nd at 7 p.m. Uh, from 2025. And so if you go back 12 hours and say, what does CESM look at 7 a.m. and then start Wharf and run, let it run for 12 hours. That was supposed to be anticlimactic. There we go. This is what uh, you get when Wharf has run for 12 hours. And this is, this, this is the same image, uh, this is, or, these are the same the same time step, I guess. Um, and so this is what downscaling is giving us. You can see there's there's the heat island from Indianapolis. That little uh, yellowish dot there is Lake Monroe. Uh, you can actually see like how strong this is a crazy strong front right here, where it's you know 15 degrees Celsius. So what we're talking 60 degrees here, and over here we're what are we? You know we're we're above 80 uh, by the time we you know get from uh, northern Indiana down to, you know, a third of the way down the state. Uh, so, so Wharf is able to um, resolve some of these like really fine scale. And you can see it's, it's quite varied. We have uh, the, the mountainous terrain uh, down in uh, Virginia and North Carolina, right? Yeah. And uh, those are, um, uh, it's, it's showing, showing up, you know, the, the cooler tempers that we're seeing down in the Smoky Mountains there. So we have Wharf giving us a bunch of data and it, it looks interesting. Is it right? So this uh, brings in the question of how good Wharf does at modeling the data. And I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds on how we're looking at and correcting Wharf, but a, a rough idea is for the historical period, you know, from 1950 to 2005, we have wharf output for every three hours. And we also know what actually happened because it was observed in history. And so there are these reanalysis data sets that say, okay, we're missing some data in different places in different areas. And these data sets attempt to resolve all those differences. And we can use them as a quasi source of truth um, for what the historical period actually looked like. And so this is February at 7 a.m every February at 7 a.m. from 1950 to um, 2005, uh, two meter temperature at Bloomington. And so the blue is the, our source of truth and the orange is what Wharf said. And so this is a, a histogram of what the temperatures might look like in, or what, what, the, di what the, the distribution of temperatures look like. So clearly Wharf is colder than it should be pretty often. Let's look at a different time step. If we look at June at 1 p.m., Wharf is a little too high. So if we want to like be really, really vague and really uh, make our assumptions off of two data points, which I don't recommend, we could say Wharf looks like it's heating up too much in the summer in the daytime and it's cooling off too much in the winter uh, overnight. And so what we do with that is we say, okay, let's push on these distributions of wharf. And let's say, let's uh, look at the, the coldest temperatures of, of, um, of wharf, they're, they're too cold. And so let's just push those in a little bit and add a couple of de degrees onto those. And by doing this, and by doing this to different sections of the data, by moving quantile by quantile, uh, we're able to uh, tell wharf uh, or to apply a correction to what wharf is outputting to line up these histograms pretty nicely uh, so we can see that wharf and our source of truth actually look really similar now. And so once we know what, okay, wharf is always four degrees too cold at February at 7 a.m. Um, in the lowest, you know, if, if the temperature is between 240 and 260 Kelvin, then we can, when we run this in the future, we can apply that same correction to all temperatures in February at 7 a.m 
that are between 240 and 260. And so we're, we're creating this, this method that uh, finds the things that Worf does badly and corrects them. And that's all I'm going to say about that because it can get complicated. Um, so let's get into the interesting part. I'm sure that you've all been just dying listening to me uh, talk about that. And you actually want to know what we're producing. So what sort of data output do we have? For the initial uh, starting point, this is what we're developing our bias correction methods off of um, and you know, kind of quality checking. And this is what we're starting with. We have two meter temperature for every three hours. Uh, we have daily maximum temperature, daily minimum temperature, and precipitation amounts for every three hours um, from 1950 to 2100. Um, these are uh, on the same grid that you saw earlier. Um, so it's uh, three kilometer resolution. The fun part about using a climate model is that climate models output a lot of stuff. Like there's tons of things in there. And so if we wanna look at, this is just what we're starting with, but once we know what other things we wanna look at, we can start doing other variables. For example, temperature at two meters every three hours, and we're starting with that, but what's the temperature, what's the vertical profile of the temperature doing? Uh, what's humidity looking like? How much water is in the, is in the air? Uh, what do winds look like? Uh, I have 10 meter temp winds listed here, but we could also do a vertical profile of winds. Um, we can get radiation fluxes, we can get surface pressures and soil temperature and moisture and surface run on, runoff. And there's, I can probably think of five or 10 more uh, variables that I didn't put on the slide. That, so there's a lot of different things that WARF is outputting. Now, how good are those? We're not sure yet. We haven't looked into any of these down here. We're, we've been focusing on temperature and precipitation so far. Um, but these are all things that we have that might be usable. Uh, they're definitely usable so long as you understand what the assumptions are behind them and, and how, how they're being calculated. So those are the sorts of data that we have. How much data are we actually talking? So remember the historical uh, period is from 1951 to 2005, and then the future period is 2006 to 2100. We have run RCP 8.5, so the, the scary bad uh, climate scenario is done. Um, and that ended up being raw output about 245 terabytes of data. Now remember, about half of that's model spin up because we throw away the first 12 hours and then we use the next 12 hours of WARF output. And close to half of that is gonna be the outer domain and the boundary conditions uh, that WARF is using. And so what we're left with is about 30 to 50 terabytes of, of data raw output uh, from WARF that's actually usable. Um, the historical is about half the time period, so it's going to be about half of RCP 8.5. Um, and if you think about, okay, I don't care about raw data, I want to know what usable data looks like. Uh, if I strip down one year of temperature, so every three hours uh, temperature data, I can get it down if I remove all the metadata I can and still have it be usable so I can assimilate it back into something that's uh, usable, I can get it down to about 1.4 gigs. Um, more likely uh, what is going to be used is something like full surface temperature. Uh, so every three hours temperature from 1950 to 2100, that ends up being about 300 gigs because it's split into multiple files and the uh, metadata needs to be repeated. Uh, one final note, uh, we have this across more than just Indiana. Uh, obviously, you can see we have we have data, you know, stretching all the way over into on the other, uh, Pennsylvania, and then uh, you know we've got couple, several states around Indiana. So our, our data is not restricted just to the state. And the reason for that is a lot of things that happen in Illinois affect what happens in Indiana. And similarly, Michigan and Ohio and Kentucky, weather doesn't contained in Indiana. So one uh, example of, a, of applications that go outside uh, the um, state is if we wanna look at the Wabash River. Wabash River, uh, watershed runs covers most of Indiana, but it's not isolated to Indiana. Um, if you look down and you know a lot of this comes out of Illinois. And so if we just cut off our study right here, we'd be missing all this data that is potentially applicable to different studies that people are trying to do. And so we do have surrounding areas uh, as well. With that, uh, that's everything I wanted to share today. 
Uh, thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions or comments or complaints or concerns or uh, applications that they'd like to talk about, um, please, please get in touch with us because that will help us uh, uh, drive what sort of directions we're going and what sort of data that we start looking into and different steps that we start taking next. Thank you, Abraham. That was great. Um, I do have a question, if you if you could. Um, you spent uh, some time talking about the size of the data um, that's being produced uh, if you strip it down minimally. If uh, myself or others uh, in participation here wanted to use that data, could, um, what's the format of that data or what would that data look like? Uh, net CDF file, you know, certainly not CSVs or something like that. Could you say right, yeah. on how to look at that? Yeah, so currently everything's in that CDF format. Okay, great. Uh, where, uh, so we do have a question in the chat from Inna. Uh, where do you store your data and run the models? I think yeah. I know the answer to this, but go ahead. Yeah, so uh, we have a slate project where all the data is being uh, stored and that's where the models get uh, I guess the model data all get stored there. Um, and then I all the simulations have been run on Big Red 3. And then uh, if you can imagine, I'm doing a lot of uh, model running on Big Red 3. So my queue time is pretty high because I've been taking a lot of computation time. And so uh, my I've been doing a lot of data processing using Karst at this point. Um, so that's that's kind of where where everything is located right now. Great, and, and for those of you in the audience, uh, uh, UITS Research Technologies has uh, allocated uh, the Grand Challenge, the PTEC Grand Challenge uh, ERI, a large uh, storage uh, space uh, for the Slate project. So if uh, others are in need of uh, storage like this, uh, like Abraham and Ben are using these large amounts of storage for research purposes, uh, we, can, um, we can accommodate or set you up with some uh, Slate project space. Okay, uh, thank you guys again. Um, we are at 1.30. Uh, I had, uh, we had on the schedule for 1.35, uh, Michelle Graff to present. Uh, I see Michelle is present with us. Uh, Michelle, would you be ready to present? Okay, great. Um, thank you again, uh, Ben and Abraham. Uh, at this point, uh, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, uh, while you're getting ready, Michelle, I guess I could introduce you and the name of your presentation. So Michelle would be, uh, Michelle Graff will be presenting on studying energy insecurity through survey research. And uh, it's, the floor is yours, Michelle, you are muted. Okay. There we go, now we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Can everyone see that, hopefully? Okay, awesome, great, thank you so much. Um, well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I sincerely appreciate um, the invitation to talk about uh, our survey research that is looking at energy and security. My name is Michelle Graff. I am a PhD candidate over at the O'Neill School of Public Environmental Affairs. I'm working with Dr. Sonia Carley, Dr. David Kniski, and another PhD student, Trevor Mehmet, um, primarily on this uh, research. Um, so uh, first and foremost, of course, I wanna thank ERI for um, providing project funding for um, part of this research. We also have funding from uh, the NSF, um, Indiana University's uh, VPR office, as well as the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So just wanna start off thanking everyone who has contributed and allowed us to conduct this research. Uh, so first I'll uh, sort of jumpstart my presentation with a conceptualization of what energy insecurity is. Um, and it's just this idea that somebody or a household, an individual is unable to meet the monthly energy demands that uh, is required to power medical devices, electronic devices, um, cook their meals, uh, turn on their lights in their home, basically unable to meet your typical household energy demands that somebody might require. And this might look like not being able to pay a monthly utility bill, 
um, or actually not even having access to electricity. We know that energy insecurity can lead to mental and physical health implications. Um, so people who suffer from energy insecurity are more likely to suffer from um, anxiety and stress, as well as um, increased rates of asthma, upper respiratory issues, and, um, and in really extreme circumstances, death. Um, a pretty uh, prominent news story that circulated in 2018 was a really terrible story about a New Jersey woman who passed away because her electricity provider turned off her power after she could not pay her electricity bill. And unfortunately, she was unable to power her electronic device um, that provided her oxygen that she relied on and unfortunately passed away. So in really extreme circumstances, obviously you get really extreme um, outcomes. So uh, the implications of energy insecurity sort of range um, across the US. We know that energy insecurity is pretty prevalent in the US from um, prior um, survey research that is conducted um, once every four or so years by the EIA. Um, it's called the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. Um, it doesn't really specifically look at energy poverty or energy insecurity in the US, um, but it does show that one in three households have reported um, difficulty paying their utility bills um, or keeping adequate temperatures in their household. Um, and about 20% of US households um, report high energy bills um, and as a result need to forego other expenses like buying nutritious food for their family or going to a doctor or purchasing um, their prescription medication in order to keep the lights on in their home. So we know that this problem um, exists. It's a material hardship that people have to deal with every day, um, but it's really under under uh, underappreciated and not really well understood. And that's really what your re the research that we're doing is aiming to help understand the scope of the problem. Um, we also know that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is likely going to exacerbate the issues of energy insecurity. Um, you can probably see that I'm at home right now. I assume a lot of you are at home right now. I'm powering my electronic device um, from home. I'm cooking more at home. Um, I'm, my lights are on more often, especially this past week in Bloomington when it was so rainy and dreary and dark. Um, so as professional, personal schooling sort of um, uh, issues move into the home, we're going to be powering these devices much more. And as a result, our electricity use has been going up. We're actually seeing an increase in electricity use while you're at home, um, where normally you'd be out of the house. Um, and as a result, we're expecting there to be um, an increase in corresponding energy bills. So if you can imagine people who potentially are losing their jobs um, are now going to have to pay more money because they're um, staying at home for the utility bill. So the um, energy insecure population is likely to not to grow um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's sort of part of our expectations and hypothesis. There have been some utility disconnection protections put in um, the US across um, uh, the states. They vary across the states in um, what they are uh, require utilities to actually do. So in some states, it's really strict and stringent, and um, they say you cannot shut off anybody's electricity. In some states, they say, well, you voluntarily can choose not to shut off people's electricity. In other states, they say nothing. Um, and so these really do vary. And it's really uncommon. I think only one state has actually um, forgiven any sort of debt. So there are a lot of people that um, say, oh, my utilities won't be shut off. That means I probably don't have to pay my bill. But in fact, as these um, orders have and are expected to expire going into the winter months, um, unfortunately, these bills are going to come due and um, some people might be finding themselves in a lot of debt, further exacerbating the issue um, of the energy insecure population. So what are the research questions we're aiming to answer with our survey research, um, the data that we're gonna collect? How prevalent is energy insecurity in the US? So is it widespread? Um, has the pandemic made it worse? What factors have led households to be more or less energy insecure? So are there certain correlates 
that explain why one household is energy insecure as opposed to another. Um, what are the implications for households when they are energy insecure? So how does this energy insecurity affect other material hardships? And how are we doing this? Through a quantitative analysis of a nationally representative sample of Americans um, at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. So this is household level data and we know um, what states that they come from. We have a pre-pandemic baseline and impact of COVID pandemic shock through multiple measures of energy insecurity that range in severity. So what are the different um, questions that we ask people? Could you pay your energy bill um, in the last um, month, did you receive a disconnection notice or were you disconnected from your utility provider? So you can see that these really range in severity. So there's a difference between not being able to pay my bill and actually being disconnected from the grid, right? So we ask people this range of energy and security to get an understanding of how, where people fall um, in these buckets, as well as how these different buckets might affect different um, issues related to energy and security. So our research design, what's our data collection? The, the main um, sort of the main scoop of this uh, presentation. So we conduct a survey design. Um, we, this is the first of its kind to track the same respondents over the course of a year. Again, all uh, low income Americans at or below 200% of the federal poverty line, all really um, trying to understand energy and security and the implications thereof um, of that issue for these households. So our first wave actually happened at the end of April and the beginning of May. Our second wave um, finished up in August um, and we just are um, reviewing all of the results for that. Uh, our third wave is gonna happen December, January, where we're gonna ask folks specifically um, about some cold weather issues. Whereas in the wave two, in the August, we talked to them about what was going on during these crazy heat waves that the, was happening across the US. And then our fourth wave is meant to be a year after the COVID-19 pandemic really began. So March, 2021. So in the first wave, we were able to collect um, information from 2,381 adults, again, at or below 200% um, of the federal poverty line. And we were um, hoping to uh, generate a nationally representative sample of this population. And we were able to get that through YouGov, um, which is an online contractor that administered the data online. We got measures of energy and security across our three um, uh, measures of severity. We collected information on socioeconomic demographics, some behavior, health issues, whether or not they received government assistance specifically related to energy, as well as other government assistance, the big ones like SNAP and TANF, as well as housing conditions. So do people live in um, efficient or deficient housing conditions? Because that has been known to um, affect how you actually are able to use your um, energy in your own home. Um, one good example is for say, if you have holes in your walls or your doors, you're obviously going to have a less efficient heating system, right? Um, heat's going to escape and um, unfortunately you might lose um, some energy that way. Some people suffer from, from having broken equipment, so broken heating or cooling equipment. And as a result, they need to resort to using um, something that's pretty dangerous, like a space heater or turning on their oven. Space heaters are um, the number one cause of household fires. Um, so, you know, they sort of turn to these issues um, uh, when they sort of have poor housing conditions. So we definitely wanted to collect information on that as well. We leverage um, different timeframes, even in the first wave of this survey, which um, I think is really interesting. So we asked questions about the last year. So starting in May of 2019, all the way through till about May 2020, the last three months, so the beginning period of the pandemic, and then in the last month, once the pandemic was really underway in the month of May. We have a separate representative sample um, of 2000 Indiana households that uh, we're also able to ask all of these questions and get a representative understanding of energy and security, not only at the national level, but also for the state of Indiana. So I'm gonna present some results of our survey. 
Um, and I'll start with the wave one national sample, and then I'll go to the um, wave one of the Indiana sample, and then I'll present some preliminary results that we have from wave two. So this graph is meant to show what energy insecurity looks like at the national level over the last month, which we see in yellow, the last three months, which we see in orange, and the last year that we see in blue. What's the prevalence? in our national sample. What we see is that the proportion of respondents that are suffering from energy insecurity in the last year, last three months, and in the last month is prevalent. It's widespread, right? So 25% of our respondents could not pay an energy bill in the last year. And 13% of those were actually just in the last month. So that means May 2020, April 2020, meaning when the pandemic was really happening. And what's actually kind of scary is if you go up to the disconnected um, portion of this graph, you see 11% could not or were disconnected from the electricity grid in the last year. And 4% um, were disconnected in the last month. And this is really when those disconnection protections that I was talking about were meant to be in place. So it's really sort of this sad and scary thing to see how prevalent these things are, even when there should be um, protection across the US, um, sort of helping people deal with this issue. So what we did is we tried to make some very um, broad approximations by scaling our representative national sample to the US population. So how many households are actually suffering from um, this issue based on the proportions that I just showed you? In the last year, we see about 4.7 million households couldn't pay an energy bill and 2 million of those were disconnected. And in the last month, two point, nearly 2.5 households could not pay an energy bill and um, nearly a million were actually disconnected from the grid. So these proportions that I just showed you in this previous slide are really scaling to like real households, right? This is a real large number of people. Um, and it, it sort of amplifies itself if you look at the number of individuals, which considers um, how many people actually live within a household. So um, let's say you're a family of five, right? The number of households counts you as a one, but the number of individuals numbers counts you as five, right? Um, so you're looking at 24 million in the last year that couldn't pay an energy bill, 10 million disconnected, and 4 million of those were disconnected just in the last month. So we're seeing these pretty large um, numbers in the last month and the last year. And again, in this last month, we sort of were hoping to see much closer to zero because these protections were sort of hoping um, to help people, especially in that disconnected column. So the data has allowed us to really not only understand the prevalence within our survey, but because it's nationally representative, we're able to scale it up to get some approximations for the entire US population of American households that are within 200% um, of the population. I should really actually take a moment and, and stress that. These are, this is not a, uh, for all US households. This is for these households that are at or below 200% of the, um, the, po uh, the federal poverty line, you know, really vulnerable, low income households we're talking about. So um, we were able to also break down the prevalence of this hidden security in the last year, last month, and um, last three months over um, different uh, socio-demographic issues. So sort of going from the bottom up of this uh, graphic, what we see is Black and Hispanic households are suffering from energy insecurity at a higher rate than white households across all three of our measures. We also see, again, moving up in this graphic, uh, households that have children under five, so young children, of course, are suffering at much higher rates than people that do not have children in their home. Those who rely on a medical device, like that New Jersey woman I spoke to you about who needed her oxygen but was disconnected, also suffering at much higher rates. Um, and then the top two lines, you're seeing those who live in deficient or inefficient housing conditions. So this could be, again, holes in the wall, broken um, AC or um, uh, heating equipment, uh, as well as things like drafty, poor insulation, mold in their household are also suffering at much higher rates um, than those who live in adequate housing conditions. Um, the full bar represents what's going on in the past years, so the last 12 months, and the dash part of the line uh, shows what's going on um, just in the last month. So the beginning part of the pandemic, again, when these 
um, protections really should have been um, in place and hopefully helping people, but um, we're still seeing obvious disconnections, which we see in blue, which is um, for a lack of a better word, a bit of a bummer. So what factors actually are predicting this energy insecurity? We run a statistical analysis um, of both the long-term, so over the past year, what we deem chronic and acute, what we deem in the last month um, due to the pandemic, energy insecurity. Um, and what we find is very similar to that um, descriptive uh, uh, graphic I just showed you. Um, Households with children under five, those that rely on an electronic device, um, Black and Hispanic households, so households of color, um, those that are sort of in the poorest group of our, um, uh, of our survey, um, under 100% of the federal poverty line, and those that live in inefficient housing conditions, all are suffering um, higher rates of energy insecurity, both in the last year and the last month. So for lack of a better words, these already vulnerable households are, are suffering across all three of these measures from energy security um, at a chronic and acute rate. So the question um, that we are curious about in um, sort of disentangling is if the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated this energy insecurity. Um, so this is again, a descriptive look at what is going on um, within our proportion of survey respondents. We break down some questions that we specifically ask about COVID. So for example, the top two lines um, are asking folks if they um, experienced any COVID symptoms or received a positive COVID test. And what we see is those that did experience COVID symptoms or received a positive COVID test are experiencing higher rates of energy insecurity. Um, those that lost job hours, so were either furloughed, um, completely lost their job or had reduced hours, were seeing higher rates of energy insecurity than those that were able to keep their job or move their job to the home, right, and continue working. Um, the next is a sort of a factor score of a group of questions we asked specifically about COVID hardship. One of the most important ones was, did you have to forego expenses um, to, in order to pay an energy bill like medical expenses? And of course we know in a pandemic, medical expenses are probably really important to be able to take care of um, or buying nutritious food, being able to cook nutritious meals, of course, during a pandemic is something that we'd like everyone to be able to do. And those experiencing these hardships did experience energy insecurity at higher rates. Um, and the last um, bit of information looks specifically at the stimulus check, the $1,200 stimulus check that um, was released by the US government um, from the CARES Act. Um, I think it was in May. Um, and those who received the stimulus check were less likely to be energy insecure and much less likely to be disconnected from the electricity grid than those that did not receive their check. Um, and again, all of these households are within 200% of the federal poverty line, and as a result, are likely um, eligible, income eligible for those checks, right? So um, we see the stimulus check actually having a pretty important impact on people being able to pay their, um, their energy bill. We run another logistic regression here um, to look at how these impacts um, have affected energy insecurity in a statistical manner, showing that the COVID stimulus receipt of it actually lowered energy insecurity like we find, COVID hardship, losing hours um, from because of COVID and then experiencing COVID symptoms all increase the prevalence of energy insecurity in the last month for um, uh, these, these households across all three of our measures. And I should say that um, this statistical analysis also includes all of the information that we included in our first um, regression analysis as well. So um, those predictors remain statistically significant as well. And in addition, we're seeing this um, impact in the last month. So what can we say about the COVID-19 pandemic from our data? We think that the pandemic deepened energy insecurity. We definitely think it made it worse and it has had an impact. They remain significant even after controlling for economic issues, especially income. Um, and the CARES Act stimulus check really stopped people from getting disconnected. So it prevented that most difficult form of energy insecurity for these households. So now I'm gonna present the results from the Indiana sample. 
And I just wanted to give an idea of where these um, folks from Indiana, since we're all living here and know the state relatively well, um, hopefully uh, are coming from. This is the um, Indiana Workforce Development's regional map. So we divided up um, based on these regions, the proportion of the sample. It's meant to be a representative sample based on proportions and other issues like race and education um, to be representative of the full state. So this is just a breakdown of where um, people are coming from and, and what the proportion of the sample looks like. So again, I'm going to start with a descriptive understanding of uh, people who are suffering from energy insecurity in the state of Indiana. Um, and again, just like in the national sample, we're seeing this as a problem in the last year, last three months, as well as the last month. Um, so starting again from the bottom, moving up, uh, we're seeing that 30% of households could not pay an energy bill in the state of Indiana in the last year. 16% of them could not pay the um, energy bill in the last month. And then if you go all the way up to disconnected, we're seeing pretty similar numbers, right? 13% of the state of Indiana um, could uh, were actually disconnected from the grid, even though Governor Holcomb did actually have protections in place, 4% were um, disconnected in the last month. Um, so we know sort of a little bit more about what was going on in the state of Indiana in terms of what Governor Holcomb's um, protections were. I think they went all the way through to August 15th and still 4% were disconnected from the grid, um, which again, as we saw with the national sample does result in real households, real people suffering um, from a loss of um, being able to turn on their lights or cook food or um, keep their homes at adequate temperatures over the summer months and during the pandemic. Again, we run the same statistical analysis. Um, we find that inefficient housing conditions, as well as the Black and Hispanic households um, in the state of Indiana, those that rely on electronic device, all of these vulnerable populations are suffering more from energy insecurity in the last year. Um, than white households, those who have adequate um, housing conditions and those that do not rely on electronic devices. So it's a similar story to the national sample, what we're seeing in the state of Indiana. In fact, state of Indiana might be a little bit more representative in terms of energy and security than we expected to what's going on with the um, national sample of these folks within 200% or um, of the federal poverty line. So I wanna give, I just wanna check my time. I wanna give a very brief um, overview of the wave two, the preliminary results. We're looking at the August um, results. We see that 37% of respondents have some form of utility debt um, at a national level. Only 38 respondents across both waves have increased their stimulus check. So these households that we think should be income eligible, um, uh, only 38% of them have received their check, 7% um, were evicted, and 64% require prescription medication, and only 18% and couldn't fill this information. So these are sort of the other implications that um, once we get more information from our future waves to sort of understand how energy and security is correlated with some of these other issues. And that's part of what this data is able to um, allow us to understand. Um, since the month of May, this is just more aggregate of wave one and wave two. 20% of the US um, national sample could not pay an energy bill, 15% received a notice and 6.5 still disconnected. We're seeing these disparities really worsen. So the black and Hispanic Native American households are all suffering across all three measures more than white households since the month of May of energy insecurity. So some um, implications, we think that they're going to be seasonal implications. We're excited to um, gather wave three data and understand what's going on um, in the cold months as compared to the hot months. We see these increasing racial disparities and worry that they might have long-term implications. Again, these shutoff moratoriums are likely going to um, continue to expire across the US, potentially making these disconnection numbers even worse. Debt accrual, so people not really fully understanding that they still have to pay their bill or just simply not being able to because they lost their job um, or for various other reasons. And we really need to start thinking about short and long term government assistance to help folks with energy insecurity. It's really a material hardship that needs to be considered. So future topics that we want to think about with this data, how do respondents cope with energy insecurity? What is the differential impact of these disconnection policies? 
um, can respondents access legal services to help them? And do respondents trust their utility provider? Does the utility provider matter um, across uh, the US? And that's really everything for today. So I'll stop sharing and um, give the floor back to other folks. Thank you, Michelle. We did have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, box. sure. Um, so uh, the first one is the energy burden data from surveys or from some publicly available data set? So the information that I just that I just um, pr provided is all from the nationally. Um, representative in the Indiana sample that we are collecting the Energy Justice Research Group through your project funding. Um, so uh, everything that I basically uh, presented in our results as well as um, sort of upfront is, is for us. Um, I think that our wave one um, sample is set to be, um, or at least a big portion of our wave one data is set to be made publicly available relatively soon. We have um, a peer reviewed publication that I think was just accepted. And I think the data sharing process is in, in transit, if you will. So hopefully it will be publicly available. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, okay, everyone. So, um, we have about one hour left. Uh, we want to wrap this up at three and it's a great thing. Uh, it's a great problem to have in that we have 15 um, data updates. So what, what are we calling it? We're calling this uh, speed data in. It's a, 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 each update will have one slide in three to five minutes. And since we have 15 participants, um, that you know three to five minutes uh, is going to roughly take up uh, 45 to 75 minutes. So I'm on the schedule for 15 minutes. I'm going to try and breeze through my um, content really quickly and provide you just some uh, links in the uh, in the recording of this so that you can come back and view my um, presentation and content at a later point. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and uh, the what I want to focus on today is uh, a new tools and resource or a data resources page and then a uh, an application a data platform that kind of uh, brings several different data sources into one, uh, I guess, platform. So uh, from the ERI landing page or from the ERI homepage, there is the tools and resources navigation. I'd like to pull, uh, point your attention to the ERI data resources uh, link. So in that ERI data resources, this is a, a new uh, page that uh, Janet mentioned uh, at the intro that the data and communications teams are kind of working together to, uh, to kind of um, put up a um, set of tools and resources for the data that is being uh, generated as part of the uh, ERI and Grand Challenge initiative. So what we have here is we have a link to this ERI data platform and a little bit about explainer about it. I'll, I'll get to this in a moment and I will spend a, a few minutes demonstrating it. Uh, but it does give you some information about what data is included on there. So uh, our um, partners at the Indiana Geological and Water Survey Indiana map data, that's all available within this ERI data platform as well as some uh, state government uh, geospatial data. And then all of the uh, data that is housed on the IU's uh, ArcGIS Online is accessible through this. Again, I'll come back and demonstrate this in a moment. But what I want to bring your attention to is these other, uh, I guess, resources within this data resources page. Uh, several of the projects that are kind of uh, uh, self-run outside of ERI, something like the uh, Purple Air and the Air Quality applications or the uh, MODIS uh, towers, the wildlife tracking applications that have uh, a standalone application or their, uh, they have their own uh, portal to distribute the data. We kind of link directly out, that, out to there from here. Uh, the same with uh, some of the uh, projects like the Hoosier Life Survey and Future Water. We can go directly to those applications and link to the data. Uh, where we have not yet uh, received the data um, uh, or it's ready for publication, we are in the process of doing these inventories. And Janet mentioned at the outset that I'm knocking on doors, trying to get a, a good inventory of what data is being generated. And then perhaps maybe a timeline about uh, when that data will be available to the public. In each of those instances, um, we're, we're pointing off to the project uh, but our plan is on these project pages, so I'll just open one of these project pages. 
our plan is for this project page to not only include details about the project and the media and the collaborators, but another chunk or block uh, somewhere in each of these uh, pages to describe the data that is being collected and the data that will be uh, soon uh, coming or forthcoming at some point. So uh, I bring this to your attention because uh, I've met with many of you or several of you and, and trying to get a sense of what data is being uh, um, collected. And for those of you that I have not, this is the intention for, uh, for those meetings with you. All right, so I want to go back and just spend a few minutes on this uh, ERI data application, uh, the data platform application, because it is a, we just kind of soft, re soft release of this application, and uh, I think we will have a news release coming out in a, a few weeks, but uh, I want to demonstrate it to you, uh, to the participants here. So um, a little splash screen basically saying navigate to your area of interest, uh, choose a, a base map, and then add your own data or use some tools here. Um, one of the, I, I will, before I get into this, I want to jump back quickly. I didn't get all the way down to these data resources. So data in progress, and then I mentioned the ERI data, uh, data partners from the Indiana map. And for those of you that were with us at last uh, semester's uh, data summit, uh, we introduced this uh, Planet Labs uh, satellite imagery for the entire globe. Uh, ERI did uh, um, enter into a contract with Planet Labs to get access to this data, and the data platform is one of the ways that uh, users can access that. So back to that data platform. This is your landing page. Uh, I mentioned uh, just go to an area. You can navigate to an area uh, using the Zoom tools or you know type in an address, look in Indiana, and take you there. Um, once you're here, I want to uh, take you to maybe uh, an area that we know there's been some substantial environmental change. Something uh, uh, like the uh, Monroe Lake. So uh, the planet satellite imagery, I can choose an individual year and uh, a year and a month. So if I wanted to go look back at what uh, March of 2020, the actual aerial photography looked like in March 2020. There it is. I want to go back and look at what it looked like in January of 2020 or a separate year, uh, 2016, maybe in April. I think you get the idea. We can use these um, resources, this Planet Labs resource in this application. So this is one of the items that I want to bring to your attention. Um, I'm going to go ahead and collapse that. Well, before I do, let's go ahead and go back to uh, a recent satellite image and then maybe from spring of March, 2020. Uh, and then I wanna point out some of the Indiana open data sources that are available here. So within the Indiana open data sources, we have all the Indiana map services. We mentioned our partners at the IGWS. Um, we're tapping directly into the Indiana map and you can see any of those Indiana map uh, layers and bring them into uh, the current map if you wanted to, um, bringing in uh, right now, there's some contour lines. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. What I want to show you is uh, some of the historical photography, like uh, if we go back and look at maybe some 1998 uh, aerial photography, and again, this is coming in from the uh, Indiana map, and it's requesting that right now. Uh, as that's coming in, we should be able to, once that's, uh, once that imagery comes in, we should be able to transition from, okay, so this is what uh, the Monroe Lake looked like in you know, 1998. And if we just adjust the transparency versus what it looks like now in uh, what, March of 2020 over on our right, we can kind of visualize this change. You can see there's a whole new uh, uh, road and uh, multiple um, houses built in here, the, obviously the docks have changed. So one example, there are a lot of uh, these historical aerial photography data sets that you can tap into and kind of uh, cycle through the transparency and look at, uh, or actually visualize uh, the environmental change taking place. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. So that was one, uh, Indiana, uh, the government, uh, state government has uh, many of uh, data sets too that are available here. I mentioned the ArcGIS online and then some uh, Indiana map layers that are hosted on ArcGIS Online. So we can tap into kind of all of these uh, and kind of bring them into this uh, data platform. I will mention that this uh, IU ArcGIS Online, anyone uh, at IU, staff, faculty, student, has access to uh, host or uh, publish content on there. So 
if you want to publish content on the IU's ArcGIS online and then bring it into an application like this, uh, you can do so. Uh, ERI, uh, we're also uh, establishing, um, I guess, layers for curated data sets. So uh, let me just refresh this page real quick. And I know one of the ones we're getting at uh, later, we'll be looking at some of the uh, artificial sky brightness or light pollution. So this is kind of a, a global data set of light pollution uh, and where that actually takes place. So we can curate, I've got a lot of, or we have a lot of curated data sets here already to just kind of display in the application. Uh, and I'm looking for input if you have particular data sets that you would like curated and available on this application, by all means, uh, contact me. I'm just gonna refresh that page real quick, get back to Indiana. And then uh, lastly, so uh, the Indiana Open data sets, the ERI curated data sets, and we can't possibly curate every data set there is. So uh, the ability to add your own data is something that we want to uh, be able to add to that. And I have here a couple of layers. I just wanted to demonstrate this one. This is a um, this is a IU hosted on iu.maps.arcgis.com. This is the Indiana COVID-19 uh, daily dashboard. So we can tap directly into that data uh, by going down here, getting that data. And I just want to copy this and go back to my uh, add your own data. And we have an ArcGIS online feature service. And I'm just going to paste that URL in there. And then we should have, um, there it is, a layer of you know daily Indiana uh, COVID cases. So for here in uh, Monroe County on, what's the date? Oh, there you go, 10, 29. We don't have today's yet, but yes, you get the idea. So the total number, so this data, um, we can tap into a lot of different data sets. And that's really what I want to bring to your attention. We can hard code or put boxes in here for individual data sets. Uh, we can search for open data sets, and then we have the ability to kind of bring your own data. So I think uh, that is kind of all I want to uh, really highlight on that with the limited time. Uh, I do want to uh, at least make this available in the video. So. Um, since I have limited time, there are videos that if you want to learn how to use this, uh, I guess, ERI data portal tool to kind of visualize environmental change, I have several uh, case studies. These are uh, usually like six minute videos. Uh, and this one is I-69 uh, section six construction update. Uh, there's some other ones, uh, some Indiana surface mining uh, taking place in Greene County. You can kind of walk through and uh, visualize some of that environmental change taking place. And then also some uh, a video here of using those tools to visualize uh, erosion, beach erosion along uh, Lake Michigan. So um, I mentioned, and this is the last thing I'll mention before I turn it on. I mentioned that we could tap into or add data from uh, multiple different, uh, sources. This is a, a kind of a documentation and the documentation is really kind of lacking yet on uh, the ERI data resources page, but that'll be one of the next, uh, I guess, areas of focus is documentation. I want to um, bring to your attention this list of um, data sets that can be, uh, I guess, brought in uh, to the uh, ERI data platform. Uh, obviously, I showed you some of the state uh, of Indiana uh, GIS servers, but they're, you know, state servers from, well, from every state. There's also here at the end um, uh, environmental groups. So if we wanted to uh, tap into, let's say, the uh, Nature Conservancy's uh, GIS data, we could kind of do that right here also. Uh, so uh, these are just resources that, um, I that will be made eventually uh, on that ERI data resources page. And with that, uh, I know we're running short on time. We only got 50 minutes and got 15 minutes for, uh, I guess, 15 data, uh, speed data in presentations that are going to be roughly three to five minutes. So I want to leave plenty of time for those. Um, and actually, uh, the data management assistant, uh, Kimberly Cook, uh, here is going to kind of take over and, um, I guess, uh, run each slide and each uh, I guess slide owner will have a few minutes. Uh, Kimberly, you want to take over at this point and talk about how it's going to uh, take place? Sure. Um, I am going to share my screen really quick and go into presentation mode. 
All right. So welcome to Speed. Da -da -da. Um, so everybody will have uh, approximately three minutes to talk about their slide. Um, I have a schedule up here. Uh, take a quick look um, so you can be prepared. Basically, uh, if you go over five minutes, I'm going to have to play hardball and cut you off because we want to hear about everybody's presentation. But uh, we will make these slides available after the data summit. So if we don't get to someone's presentation, um, you can still you will still be able to view it afterwards. Um, so we'll kick it off with the Urban Green Infrastructure Group. Um, so Heather Reynolds, I know I saw her. Maybe. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Would you like to share yeah. your screen or would you? Yeah. yeah, I have a screen to share. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Trying to put that in presentation mode. There we go. Can you see Perfect. that? Okay. So quickly, I'm going to be really quick because you asked for it. Uh, research context is resilience of urban social ecological systems. So basically, we're dealing with cities here, uh, cities as, as social ecological systems. Our process is we go to municipal partners, um, various other sorts of uh, partner resources uh, like consulting firms that do tree inventories for cities. And we collect green space, climate and social spatial, spatial data from them or from uscensus.gov or we create it ourselves if we have to by going out and GPSing green roofs or something. Data are cleaned, metadata is written and the data is uploaded to our spatial data platform. That brings me to our data deliverables. The main is uh, a spatial data platform called Indiana Green City Mapper. Uh, we have a link to this site, which is uh, well into development. We're exploring ways to integrate that with the ERI site, but it may just have to be a link. So this is a spatial data platform that will enable cities to mitigate their climate change challenges, heat stress, flooding, food security, et cetera, by being able to visualize where their green infrastructure is, where the climate issues are, where the social vulnerabilities are, et cetera. The data is fine-grained. The geographic scope varies from you know, a couple of cities to, for some of the data we have, we're getting more statewide um, scope. Um, it can easily integrate with other sources via GIS web services. And products include story maps, of which we already have two that will be featured on the platform, technical articles on how to develop this type of platform, and scholarly articles associated with resilience analyses that we're doing. This data set is so rich, it's allowing us to look very differently at resilience questions. And for example, we're, we're now looking at a, a um, urban forest equity by not just looking at the spatial distribution of urban forests, but quality of the urban forest, which is a very a new contribution. So I'll end there. Can I, do I have to stop sharing? Sorry, it's in my way. There you go. Thank you, Heather. That's great. Kimberly, you're muted. Anybody else have that one on Zoom bingo? Haha. -ha. All right. So that's exciting. All right. Going into presentation mode. So we're moving on to the migratory birds as transmission pathways of emerging zoonoses. Alex Young. Hello. Hello. Uh do I need to share my screen or I guess uh, it's right Yep, I have got it up there for you. Okay, um, so we're uh, studying mostly migratory uh, American robins. They're widespread across the continent. Um, we've been sampling them basically uh, to understand their movements using uh, GPS trackers. 
and collecting blood from each one of them to collect disease data. So my colleagues on this are Dan Becker, um, a postdoc in Ellen Ketterson's lab and Ellen Ketterson. So we um, are focused mainly on understanding the role that American robins are playing in dispersing tick-borne diseases across um, North America. And yeah, so uh, basically we, we are collecting movement data through GPS uh, loggers and uh, disease data through the blood. Um, so the idea is to forecast how uh, robins are spreading zoonotic diseases, uh, tick diseases specific. Um, and we're basically at a, at a stage right now of data collection and preliminary, very preliminary analysis. The, Data that's come in so far is very promising. Birds, uh, robins here in Indiana appear to be partially migratory, so some go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico for the winter, and some stay. So that's interesting because it means that um, there's a, there's going to be a lot of variation in how they're moving diseases around. And the latest update is we're about to start a collaboration with the Max Planck Institute in Germany to use satellite transmitters. So we should have a lot more data coming in since. Uh, it, it'll be coming in every two days, hopefully, through uh, a satellite, well, through the International Space Station and uh, transmitting the data instead of us having to wait to catch the robin all, all over again after it migrates. And that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, seems like you're going to have a lot of very interesting data to share. So, mm -hmm. Perfect. all right, next we have light at night, migration and disease. from the Ketterson lab, anybody? Yeah, I think that uh, slide was uh, uh, submitted by Ellen and I think she was with us, whether or not she is any longer, let me see. I am I still here. Okay. I Ellen, actually would you uh, be able to speak to a mom uh, for a moment on this slide? Yeah, I Great. wasn't expecting to speak, so I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, this is work that's being led by uh, Dan Becker and Devraj Singh, and they are studying uh, the impact of light at night on the annual cycles of songbirds, finding that light at night actually accelerates the rate at which they prepare for migration and, and reproduction, and whether light at night has an impact on latent um, I'll just call them malaria infections, which are known to kind of go down in the winter and then reemerge uh, in the spring. And what the work showed that is depicted here in this slide was that uh, Junko as a songbird exposed to light at night were more likely to exhibit elevated levels of the avian malaria. So there are two data things here. Uh, showing the increase, the tan line being what uh, birds experienced if they were exposed to late at, light at night. And there were two different populations compared, one that's resident and one that's migrant, and the impact on um, these affection, infections re-emerging was similar on both populations. So we hope that this will be useful uh, for both suburban and urban landscapes to know not just that um, nocturnal lighting, artificial nocturnal lighting, has an impact on timing of reproduction and breeding, but also has an impact on the likelihood of a bird being infected and therefore infecting other birds uh, because it's mosquitoes that pass the infections back and forth. This paper was just published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, which is kind of a big deal. And uh, Dan Becker was the lead on this paper. So that's it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple more slides from your group. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable presenting, um, just let us know. Uh, we've got window strikes at IU next. Well, Sarah Wanamaker is here, I believe. Oh. Sarah, would you like to talk about your slide? Uh, yeah, I'm here. I didn't know I would be presenting, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm Sarah Wanamaker. My, I have this current project that is I'm working to quantify window strikes on IU Bloomington campus. So what I'm doing is I chose 
six buildings on campus that are relatively high risk in that um, they have a lot of glass, they're very tall, and I'm monitoring those buildings a couple times a week to look for bird carcasses. I've been doing this for about a month and I'm at 54 dead birds that I found at just those six buildings. Uh, so the, the end goal is to try to find a solution and work towards making at least some of these buildings on campus bird safe by using uh, window decals or one-way transparency film. I have talked to a building manage manager, Pete Goodwin, that works at the um, GISB building on campus that is a really bad offender. And he has been using vocalizations. He plays bird playback from the top of the building. Um, and apparently that worked at first, but then the birds became habituated to it. So you know, we hope to find a cost effective but functional solution for IU campus. Um, I also hope to develop a carcass persistence study. And the, the purpose of that study would be to estimate basically uh, what is my, my search efficiency? Um, how do I scale up the numbers that I'm finding to try to calculate what the actual number of bird fatalities are on campus. And uh, I think that pretty much sums it up. Thank you. Great, thank you for sharing. This is a very exciting project and I'm, I'm excited to see what you find. Thank you. Um, all right, next up we have migration, birds and pesticides. I'll take this one again. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, this project is being led by Allie Bird and Katie Talbot and again, Don, Dan Becker. And we're uh, following up on a study of a songbird in Canada that was measured during its halfway point on a migration. And half the birds that were captured were given um, a dose of something that could have contained a pesticide but didn't, so they were the controls. And another set was injected with a pesticide and the dependent variable, the thing that they measured, was how long was it before the birds took off again to complete their migration. And they found that, and this is the first study of its kind, so it showed up in science, they found that a small dose of pesticide known as a neonicotinoid, which is often used in agricultural settings, slowed the birds down. It took them longer uh, to depart from their, what's called a stopover site. So we wanted to know whether the whole, same thing held here in Indiana. We used a different species called the junco, and we tracked their movements uh, with a set of towers known as modus towers, uh, some of which Allie Bird has set up around here. So caught the birds, injected some, or really gave them in their mouth, allowed them to swallow uh, a dose of the pesticide and others not, and then put tags on them that are called most tags that can be picked up by the towers and let them go. We also wanted to know whether they carried malaria. So this is a, an, another uh, connection between disease ecology and migration that we've seen in Alex's work and the light at night work. So the graph on the left simply shows um, what the infection level of malaria was in the two sets of birds, those that before getting a, a dose of the um, pesticide. And then afterwards, uh, the ones that were diseased or not diseased and when they all took off. So if they were diseased and got a dose of the pesticide, they were delayed in their spring departure for their migratory grounds. If they were not diseased and dosed with a the pesticide, then they left at the same time as those that were um, given just a, a batch of oil. Uh, so interaction first described really perhaps anywhere between uh, pesticide use and the presence of a disease in, in the birds. And the pes pesticide, to sum up, the pesticide is harder uh, on diseased birds in terms of departure than it is on non-diseased birds. So we'll work with other researchers who are studying wildlife disease dynamics in the future. And we believe it'll be relevant to public health and to people that are uh, attempting to monitor uh, bird health and wildlife health 
uh, on a global scale. So thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Once again, a very, very exciting project. Alrighty. Oop, there we go. Um, this is just more information about that particular project. Um, and finally, from the Ketterson Group, we have birds per bird predation on livestock, the black vulture. This is Matt Hauser present? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. You want to talk about this slide? <laughs> yeah, sure. This one's a surprise for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the proposal right now where uh, the short version of it is that there's this uh, relatively new um, vault type of vulture, not new, and uh, new in the sense that it's much more frequent and present in places like Indiana and, and sort of like the lower Midwest and increasingly upper Midwest than it used to be. We're not quite sure why it's here, but climate change is likely a factor. And uh, black vultures, which we're focusing on here compared to turkey vultures, uh, they, there's some evidence that they're actually killing animals, killing cattle, specifically uh, calves as they're being born, causing uh, quite a bit of, of financial harm to the cattle farmers across the region. So we put in a proposal, we wanted to understand um, the most effective way, essentially, it's a very practical proposal, this is into the USDA, the most effective way that farmers can manage uh, and prepare for the likelihood that black vultures will be around them and potentially harming their cattle, uh, but also uh, ensure that they're managing in a way that will not harm other migratory birds. Uh, we think there's a slight possibility that farmers would be using poison or something uh, like that. So it's it's going to be Abigail Sullivan, myself as, as sort of the social scientist, and then Allie Bird, Sarah Wanamaker, Whitney Schnagel uh, from biology, and, and Ellen uh, all working together to try to tease out these social and, and biophysical dimensions of it. What are farmers doing and then what are the consequences of those management responses for how birds act? Um, and, and right now we're uh, based on the grant, we're really focused on providing data back to the farmers. So this won't only uh, involve sort of like how effective was your response to the farmers we work with. We'll also uh, hold field days that are open to farmers of the general public to come and we'll teach them what we learned and how they can implement those management practices on their farms. Great, very cool. Thank you for sharing. Uh, more information about that particular slide. Any other comments, Matt? Uh, Ellen, did I get everything? I'm muted. I thought that was a great job. I love the project. I'm glad you're leading it. So. No, you're leading it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see, folks. <laughs> we have <laughs> things to work out. <laughs> That's why we have these things, so everybody knows what's going on. Alrighty, um, next we're going to move on to the Pest and Invasive Species Research Cluster. First off, we have Assessing Vector Competence for Indiana Mosquito Populations. Presenter? Hi, so my name is Tamanash, and uh, I'll be presenting the data that is joined in collaboration with the Newton Lab and the Hardy Lab in the Microbiology Department here at IU. So yeah, our goal is to assess the vector competence of the local mosquito populations that we have collected um, personally, and also that has been collected over the past uh, several years by Keith Clay's group. Um, and the aims of the project are outlined here, where we want to know the distribution of the different mosquito species in South Central Indiana. We want to know the prevalence of mosquito-borne pathogens. We're primarily interested in viruses, but ultimately we want to move on to doing a deep sequencing approach to get uh, a whole idea of like what other potential pathogens are being uh, transmitted or there's a chance of being transmitted by these mosquitoes. And what is especially a topic of interest in the Newton and the Hardy Labs is the presence of this um, symbiotic bacteria, Wolbachia pipientis. Um, so over the past few years, uh, this has been the crux of my project, uh, thesis project. The presence of this endosymbiont essentially um, stops viruses from replicating inside the mosquito. So um, 
it's a really good way to control the transmission and the overall vectorial capacity of mosquitoes. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, certain mosquito species are naturally infected with Wolbachia. So if they are present and we find them in our local mosquito population, that would allow us to gauge their vector competence, i.e. if they have a natural Wolbachia population present inside them, then we can sort of assume or infer based on our current data that it will reduce the transmission of certain kinds of RNA viruses. Um, examples of such RNA viruses that are a potential threat are um, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, chikungunya virus, Zika virus, West Nile, yellow fever, uh, amongst others. Um, so this, uh, additionally, we want to also determine how temperature and rainfall influence the mosquito populations and therefore its vector competence, including the presence of pathogenic vi viruses and Wolbachia. Uh, so kind of have an assessment of how the changes in the current um, climate changes impact this sort of uh, scenario. Uh, we are currently at the collect data collection stage and here I'm showing some preliminary data that I have. Uh, we have screened a total, so this is a quantitative PCR-based assay, and the goal is to determine the presence of these RNA viruses as well as the presence of Wolbachia from the same samples um, to sort of look at the correlative effect. As of now, uh, out of the total 85 uh, individual species of uh, individual mosquitoes that have been screened, 32% uh, of them, roughly a third of them seem to be carrying Wolbachia as detected by our PCR-based assay. And on the right, we have a breakdown of the different species uh, of um, mosquitoes. Some of the things that I would like to point out is uh, that is of a special interest is if you look at the Culex pipians data point, half of them roughly that have been collected uh, contain a natural Wolbachia infection and half do not. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, the half that do uh, carry Wolbachia were all collected recently from urban settings uh, within uh, the Bloomington and local adjacent areas. Um, the half that weren't uh, found to harbor Wolbachia were all collected from non-urban settings, specifically from the Kent farm area and they were all Wolbachia negative. So we're really excited about this uh, trend that we're uh, seeing. What this would mean is that assuming functional um, blockage of RNA virus replication, we might expect a lower chance of virus transmission in urban as compared to non-urban um, settings. Uh, as of this moment, we're presently performing virus screenings on these samples as well, as well as expanding our overall data set. And we're really excited about the findings in the future. And thank you. Thank you, Tom and Ash. That was wonderful. This, oh, it's so much exciting research happening. Um, already, Project Vector Shield. Chris, are you around? Yep, I'm here. All right. Um, so I'm Chris. I uh, was the field biologist on Project Vector Shield, uh, the PI being Keith Clay. And this project was aiming to, uh, it's aiming to survey the tick and mosquito communities throughout southern, the southern half of Indiana um, in order to assess the disease risk posed in the context of vector-borne disease by those communities. So we um, collected tick and mosquito samples from 20 sites, uh, mostly at state parks. Um, from the spring through the fall in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And then those samples, uh, many of them have been sorted and identified so that we know where we caught things, when we caught things, and how many of those things we caught. Um, as far as an update of, of what some of our data findings are, um, one of the big things that we found is that there seems to be a wider established distribution of two of the tick species that we frequently captured, one being Amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick, and the other being Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged deer tick. So you can kind of see some of this in the uh, map to the right, 
where each county has um, four white squares, each re representing a different tick species that we uh, captured. The upper left white square may or may not have a black circle in it. If there is, it, that would mean that that Amblyoma americanum is present in that, in that county, according to our data. The dark black meaning that it's an established population, gray just meaning that we just found enough individuals to report it, but likely that there's not a, a breeding population, at least according to, to what we found. So as you can see, most of the counties have that uh, circle representing Amblyoma americanum in them. And previously, the only the southernmost counties in Indiana were thought to have these established populations. Um, a similar pattern is being seen by our data in uh, Ixodes scapularis, where originally in like the, the late 80s and early 90s, the black legged deer tick was only found in the northwestern counties of Indiana. Um, and then more recently, it's starting to, to be found also in the uh, sort of central western section of Indiana, but we have found it in most of the counties that we sampled, um, denoted by the black diamond in the lower left uh, square of the sort of setup for each county. Um, and then we also have some pathogen data from these tick uh, samples that we were able to sequence. And we did find the presence of Borrelia bacteria in both the Amblyoma americanum and the Ixodes scapularis. So when Borrelia is in an Amblyoma americanum, um, it's often Borrelia lone starii, which is thought to be connected with that southern tick associated rash illness. Um, and we did find that in many of the counties um, that are in red and also in purple. Uh, and then you can also see specifically when Borrelia was found in Amblyoma americanum, there's that, that, that red or purple dot in, uh, in, the, in the black circle. Um, and then also another Borrelia species, Borrelia burgdorferi, is the causative agent of Lyme disease, and that is found generally in Ixodes scapularis. And so we also saw that in four counties, Ripley, Jefferson, um, Posey and Union, so pretty widespread throughout um, the distribution of our sites. And then finally, we also found uh, Ehrlichia species in Amblyoma americanum, which uh, causes Ehrlichiosis, and we found that in four counties as well. Um, as far as deliverables being produced by the project currently, we're preparing a publication to describe those tick range expansions in the Lone Star Tick and the Black-Legged Deer Tick. Uh, in Indiana, and we will be making the data associated with, with that publication available through that ERI data portal that um, Justin had talked about earlier. And I think that would wrap up what I have for today. Great, thank you very much for sharing. That wraps up the project or the pest and invasive species. We're moving on to the McBean lab. Um, so we've got a couple of presentations here about semi-arid ecosystems. Uh, first up about biosphere model prediction. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Kashif Mahmood, a postdoc with Natasha McBean in Department of Geography. Currently we are working to improve the terrestrial biosphere model prediction of semi-arid ecosystem carbon dioxide exchange. Uh, recent modeling studies have shown that semi-arid ecosystems play a dominant role in the interannual variability of global carbon sink. However, the global terrestrial biosphere models used in these studies have not been extensively tested or optimized against semi-arid field data. So a recent study comparing a suit of these models to uh, semi-arid site carbon dioxide flux data showed that all models actually underestimate both the mean annual carbon budget and the net carbon dioxide flux interannual variability. But it remains to be seen that whether these model data discrepancies are due to inaccurate model parameters or uh, inaccurate model processes. To bridge this gap, we tested whether parameter optimization could alleviate uh, these model data discrepancy in semi-arid ecosystem. Uh, we also aimed to identify the physiological processes causing these potential data model misfit. 
Uh, to fulfill this goal, uh, we um, utilized carbon dioxide flux observations from 12 emitted flux sites uh, spanning Southwest US semi-arid uh, grass shrub forest ecosystems. Uh, here are uh, photos of two of the sites uh, with flux towers. Uh, the left one is called VCP, which is an evergreen needle leaf pine forest in New Mexico. And the right one is uh, WHS, which is an open shrubland site in Arizona. Uh, the data are open source field data and processed in net CDF format after gap filling, uh, flux partitioning, and so on. Uh, the net ecosystem exchange, in short NEE, data are shown by the gray lines uh, in these two time series for both these two sites. Uh, utilizing this data, we used a Bayesian data simulation framework to optimize carbon cycle related parameters of ORCID terrestrial biosphere model. The prior and posterior models NEE time series are shown in green and red colors respectively in both these time series, uh, which shows a massive improvement in model predictions. And uh, the data deliverables, uh, the optimization outputs, including all the model parameters are stored in a GitHub repository for open access for all the ecosystem modeling groups uh, to achieve reliable estimates of semi-arid ecosystem contributions to the global carbon cycle. So that's all for this slide. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Kashi. Um, next up, we have multi-source remote sensing data fusion. Hi, uh, I'm Rubaya Parvin. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and working with Dr. Uh, McBean. So uh, I'm interested in uh, vegetation distribution in dryland ecosystem. And in this project I'm working uh, in is titled Multi-Source Remote Sensing Data Fusion. So uh, the vegetation in these areas are mostly combination of uh, grasses and smaller shrubs that you can see in these pictures, how they are distributed in between grasses and bare lands. And my research question is, how does the classification method and combination of different remote sensing data type affect uh, the shrub distribution accuracy in this heterogeneous environment? So from my research question and topic, you probably guess that I mostly work with remote sensing data and I am using pre existing remote sensing data provided by NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. And they provide uh, hyperspectral images that has hundreds of spectral bands. And uh, these data is provided in HDF5 file format and they also provided LiDAR data. I'm using their LiDAR canopy height data at one meter resolution. So in my unique approach, I am fusing the later height, the smaller shrub height information as a image layer within the hyperspectral image. So you can see this uh, diagram here. And I am uh, fusing this method and I'm trying four different classification method to detect uh, this smaller shrub accurately. So, uh, I, because of time limitation, I'm not going to discuss about the detail of this classification method, but using this classification, the data deliverable that I will produce will be the uh, fractional uh, shrub cover map and shrub grass bare maps. So for this classification, the total data I am downloading from NEON is about uh, one terabyte. That's why I am using, uh, I use supercomputer to store my data and, running my classification from there. So I have written all my classification codes in Python and I will make those uh, code available, publicly available so that other researcher can use those codes and apply in other regions to detect uh, vegetation. And these uh, land cover maps can be directly used in uh, land surface modeling and also can be used to validate vegetation demographic modeling. And uh, furthermore, uh, the ranch land managers can also use these maps to detect, uh, to get the location of shrubs. So these are the broader implication of uh, this uh, project. And thank you for listening to me. Great, thank you so much. Um, we only have a couple of presentations left. We're over, a little bit over time. Um, Justin, are we still okay? Because I think we have uh, extra time. I don't, are we over time? Uh, I, yeah, if we don't get to the, uh, I guess, the needs discussion, I think that's okay. Okay.
Okay. Um, next up, we have Eric Sandweiss and Matt Hauser. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, thanks, everybody. We have uh, old news and new news on our section. I feel a little bit like uh, the kid at the grown-ups table at the data summit here, but <laughs> well, it's data, uh, and I hope uh, interesting data at that. Uh, Kimberly and Justin and others have helped us to create the uh, HLS Who's Your Life Survey um, opinion map, which is one expression of the data that we received, highlights of the data that we received from the big um, social survey that we put out late uh, last year and then analyzed in the spring of 2020. So in terms of what's available of that data, as I said, Highlights are, are uh, spatially visualized on the opinion survey map, uh, but the actual numbers in greater depth that we developed with our partners at IU's Center for Survey Research, uh, Ashley and Leanne and their colleagues, those are also accessible uh, through us for people who want to know more about how environmental change really is affecting Hoosiers at an everyday level, what they're hearing about it, what they believe about it, what they're willing to do about it. So in terms of the old news, looking back, taking those data from uh, the Hoosier, Hoosier Life survey, our goal has been in these most recent months to really express in everyday language what the, what the results tell us. And so in articles like the ones that you see on the screen, and elsewhere, we are trying to uh, put the word out, especially with the, uh, the able assistance of Jonathan Hines in the ERI office, trying to reach reporters and editorial pages across the state and tell them more about what we're finding about what Indiana believes and what it wants to know more about. And so reaching out to places like Fort Wayne, South Bend, Evansville, Indianapolis, and elsewhere, we're able to give them both the granular level of here's what your community is thinking about, and then the more uh, general level of here's how it relates to broader opinions and actions across the state of Indiana. So that's been our job looking back. Looking forward, we were uh, most fortunate to get ERI support uh, for continuing the survey in light of a fundamental and really major social shift that happened after all of our results were in. And that of course was uh, the arrival of uh, COVID-19 uh, on these shores early in this year. Based on that very fundamental shift and all of the things that it triggered in our economy and in our political environment, we resolved to go back to a certain group of our respondents and ask them again what they're thinking about environmental change in light of the changes in our society. That's where uh, Matt Hauser picks up the story. So I will turn it over to him. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I'll, I'll just note that the, we're calling this the second Hoosier Life Survey, maybe a, a little bit of lack of creativity, but Hoosier Life Survey 2.0. Uh, we're we're going to be following up with people. We we know from some past environmental research that these major shifts, it's usually related to economic crises. We have one of those in, in, the, in the workings, but we also have a public health crisis. We know these shifts tend to uh, uh, lead people to change their attitudes and their concerns about the environment. And so this is a really unique opportunity considering that we got the final responses for the first Tudor Life Survey just before uh, COVID really became uh, an issue here to see how since that time point people in the state uh, have shifted over time and how they're thinking about climate change. So that survey, we're very close to having that one out in the field right now. We just completed our final draft of the questionnaire uh, and hopefully by uh, 2021, we're able to put out another layer in the um, climate change opinions map on the ERI website update what we currently have and give you a before and after COVID look at how the state is viewing um, climate change and a, and a variety of other related issues. 
Awesome. Thank you, Eric and Matt. Um, Matt, will you mind discussing your Soil Microbes and Farmers project? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this, this is a National Science Foundation funded project uh, called uh, Resilience to Drought or a Drought of Resilience. It's being led by Jen Lau and in the biology department, along with uh, myself, uh, Lizzie Grennan Browning, um, Jay Lennon, and then a couple of people at Michigan State University, our collaborators there. This is a five-year project that begins in January. We're really uh, excited about it. And the, the short version of it is um, drought is coming to the Midwest. It's gonna happen more frequently uh, and more significantly. A lot of it will be called agricultural drought. So it won't be an actual physical drought, but crops will experience it like a drought. So what we expect yield declines because of this. And the degree to which agriculture and farmers will be impacted by these depends on adaptation. It depends on soil adaptation, so how microbial communities respond. It depends on how farmers respond, whether or not they're using practices like cover crops and no-till or irrigation. And it depends on how those two things interact. So we think there's a possibility that irrigation, which is one of the most widely used adaptation responses to drought, actually, and I'm a social scientist, so keep that in mind, actually makes soil microbial communities dumber. And it leads them to evolve to become, uh, to provide less resilience to drought over time, creating a positive feedback loop where you need more and more irrigation over time to get the same benefits. So we're gonna go out and do interviews with farmers to understand their current adaptation responses. Biologists will come out with the social scientists and will measure soil microbial communities from these farmers to get a sense of how soil health management versus irrigation leads to different types of microbial communities. Lizzie Grenning Browning is gonna do oral histories with farmers to understand how they view and, and have adapted to drought and other climactic extremes over their tenure. And, and keep in mind the average farmer in the Midwest is like 60 years old. So they're gonna have some wonderful perspectives, a really rich understanding of climate change over time. And then we're gonna feed that information, the soil microbial uh, information back to farmers uh, in like year four of the project to see if that shifts their views at all. If we can show them that they are eroding their soil's capacity to provide resilience to drought over time, do they want to, and more importantly, do they feel like they can change their practices? We expect, again, this will be related to irrigators. We have a number of um, public data availability uh, ideas going right now. So Lizzie, I think, is gonna be doing a very exciting dimension of this, where she's gonna be going to like state and county fairs this, uh, with a, um, a history exhibit showing the oral histories of, of farmers the social science research with the interviews and the, the soil data will be provided to Indiana Maps where we'll be able to uh, give a layer essentially to the Indiana Maps and they'll, they'll show the, some of the uh, qualitative data and the soil microbial data there. That will be publicly available. And um, we're also planning on uh, doing a workshop at ERI, but also at the Kellogg Biological Station, which is our Michigan State partner uh, to show modeling techniques and convergence ideas on how to do a social and ecological systems model, uh, bringing together two data sets towards understanding adaptation and evolution over time. It'll probably be highly focused on uh, structural equation modeling, multi-level structural equation modeling. Uh, but you know that's down the road a little bit. We'll get it on everyone's schedule whenever we get there. That sounds a, like a very highly multidisciplinary collaborative project. And that's that's very exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, so we had one more slide. However, this person is not here, I don't believe. So it will be part of the slide deck um, that we can send around. And I will stop my screen share. Thank you, everybody, for being good sports about the time. Um, everything, all of your research sounds amazing. Can't wait to see where it goes. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, I'd like to add, I, I thank you so much for the participation. It was great to see so many people willing to uh, update uh, their projects and the data that is being produced. It's really great to see uh, 
so much diverse uh, data and research taking place. We uh, have the last item as kind of a, an open discussion about data uh, needs and um, I don't know that we really have time to give that a proper discussion, but uh, if uh, there are particular data needs or uh, you just like to meet up with me and talk uh, data, myself and Kimberly, uh, I'd be happy to uh, set up an interview or set up a, uh, a Zoom uh, chat with you about that. With that, uh, we made it through everything else and um, have a happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much for, uh, again, for your participation and for sticking around.